The purpose of this program is to give you an overview about ALS so that you can understand more about the disease as well as some of the resources available to you. This video is for educational use only. It is not intended to replace consultation with your healthcare provider. So let's talk about cognitive and behavioral changes that may or may not happen in ALS. Up until about 15 years ago, we always said that the mind stayed sharp as the body became weaker <coughs> and weaker and weaker. Now we know that there's a percentage of people that do have some changes in thinking and memory or behavior changes, and that that might be as many as 40% of people with ALS. It might be to a very minor degree, or it might be to a more severe degree. So it's relatively common. There's degeneration of the nerves in the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain. So just like the muscles get smaller in ALS, the brain gets a little bit smaller in a progressive way. That means it changes over time. It gets worse over time. Um, and it can be behavior changes, thinking and memory changes, one or the other, or both. It can affect decision making. Say a recommendation is made for non-invasive ventilation at night. Say a recommendation is made for a feeding tube. Say a recommendation is made for a walker or a wheelchair. People with cognitive changes won't be able to really process that information well. And they may think, oh, I don't really need that. I've gotten stitches three times in the last two months, but I don't need a walker. <coughs> I'm fine. Okay? And when it affects decisions such as using a piece of equipment that would be really beneficial, it can also affect longevity. So, we can look at the different kinds of behavior or, um, or cognitive changes, thinking and memory changes in ALS. So ALS-CI is ALS with cognitive impairment. So it's problems with executive function. What's executive function? <coughs> executive function is taking in lots of information, making sense out of it, and making good decisions. Driving is an executive function. Uh, and a very complex executive function, and that's why we don't fool with our texting on the phone when we're driving. It's too complex. Behavioral variant. So people have one of two <coughs> flavors, generally speaking, with the behavioral variant. They'll become inward, apathetic, lose interest in what's going on. This is particularly hard on the families in that um, maybe the dad has ALS and he's got some kids and he becomes, becomes totally disinterested in what's going on in the kids' school life and that kind of thing and the kids don't understand. So there's a lot of education that needs to go on. Um, or the person becomes disinhibited, usually not both. Disinhibited, you know, we've all got that social filter. We learned how to control what we say and how we act in public according to the social norms that we have. Well, that filter can go away and somebody can be disinhibited. Crude joke, jokes that are uh, inappropriate, inappropriate touching, um, inappropriate activities, uh, they could be sexual activities. I mean, it, uh, in the extreme, the disinhibition can be really, really quite difficult. But what, what we see mostly is language, <coughs> inappropriate jokes, and um, that kind of thing. ALS with frontal temporal dementia. True dementia is more rare than behavior or, or cognitive impairment. And it's only diagnosed by a trained neuropsychologist two, three, four hours worth of testing that's done over one or two sessions, someone who really knows what they're doing. Um, 
there is extensive criteria, it's clear criteria that must be met. So you never say that someone has frontal temporal dementia or has dementia with ALS unless it's been tested by a neuropsychologist. What we're looking at here are changes from before illness. So let's say that somebody's got some wacko behavior, but they've always been wacko, okay? <laughs> they don't have FTD, they're just a little different, <laughs> all right? And that's okay. But if it's a change and they've become wacko, well, let's take a look at it and maybe get a referral to a neuropsychologist. So again, the, the good news is if we recognize it, we know it's there, we can understand it, and we can do something about it. So let's look at the incidence here. So I love these little pie charts. You take everybody with ALS, about 48% of the people with ALS will never have any cognitive problems uh, at all, or behavior problems. Common things being common, Alzheimer's disease, in an older population, we're going to see some of that. It has nothing to do with uh, frontal temporal dementia. It has nothing to do with the ALS. It's just you can have two things wrong at the same time. The thing that I want to say about the frontal and <coughs> temporal areas of the brain is that they are right next to the motor cortex. So there's a little overlap with damage there. Question in the back? Oh, okay. Um, so if we look at people that have cognitive problems, cognitive impairment, it'll be about 9% of people with ALS will have executive dysfunction problems, decision-making problems. One of those things is lack of insight. So I gave the example a few minutes ago about someone who's bonking their head and going to the ER to get stitches all the time, but they don't need to use a walker. They lack the insight that, yeah, there's cause and effect here. I really do need that walker. Behavior variant, much more common than simple <laughs> cognitive problems. But, and then true FTD, about 22% of people. And again, can have it to a mild or a greater degree. Let's look at the genetic overlap here. So we know that if you have ALS, you've got 100 people with ALS, 10 of them will have it running in their family. If you have 100 people with FTD, 40% of those will have it running in the family. In ALS FTD, some family members may only have ALS, some family members may only have FTD, and some family members will have both, and many family members will have neither. Okay, so there is certainly a genetic component to frontal temporal dementia. But there are some strategies for people um, who have this part of their brain getting a little bit smaller. So you think of the, the executive function, why do teenagers make such horrible decisions sometimes? It's because the frontal lobe is the last lobe to be fully developed in humans, and it's at age 20, 22, and I always joke that it's a little bit later in boys than it is in girls, but anyway. So if someone has difficulty making decisions, present questions to them that are simpler. Not what do you want for dinner, but do you want hamburgers or chicken for dinner? It's a simpler way to do things. So there are lots of ways to simplify. If someone has this to a greater degree, they're going to, and, and they don't understand a lot of what's going on, you want, just as in Alzheimer's, you want to have a warm environment, consistent routine, and if you're trying to get somebody to not do something, the easiest way to do that, or the most effective way to do that, is not to say, don't do that, but to say, do, do this instead. Again, some of the same things that you can use for Alzheimer's. Now, there's a big difference between frontotemporal dementia and Alzheimer's, completely different areas of the brain. 
in Alzheimer's, it starts with uh, memory problems. In FTD, it starts with the problems that we've described here, and then memory is much, much later. So it's almost like they're flipped. Um, give lots of praise for good behavior. Talking with families, it's our job in the clinic to talk with families about what this is and how best to manage it. So we know that it's going to be progressive. So what we want to do is anticipate changes. And if somebody's going to need, for instance, a speech generating device, let's get that on board a little bit earlier than later so that they can learn how to do this when they're more apt to uh, take to it. Getting that power of attorney for medical needs and financial needs is important. In executive function issues, logic does not work. So think of a child, very, very immature frontal lobe, and you're saying to that child some things about doing this or doing that, and you're trying to have logic with a young child. Logic doesn't work with a young child. They have to be older in order for logic to work. So in someone that has pretty bad FTD, trying to make them understand cause and effect is just wasting your time and frustrating them. Um, now, testing. So in the clinic, in a good multidisciplinary clinic, what you're going to see is people that can do a bedside test and we use the ALS cognitive behavioral screen. So we use the ALS cognitive behavioral screen. It's a five minute quick test. Gives us an idea if there are changes or not. And then we can uh, send the patient on to a referral to a neuropsychologist if it looks like that's what they need. Oops. And then some resources. I think it's important the Family Caregiver Alliance focuses on brain diseases. The ALS Association has some excellent fact sheets, FYI informational fact sheets. ALS and Cognitive Changes, a guide for patients and families, um, is really pretty darn good. And for professionals, there's uh, a like kind of FYI thing that's there. <coughs> 